Okay, so we're finally up, and uh, so sorry for uh, being uh, a little delayed today. We had some technical problems, but here we go. Welcome to today's edition of uh, Tech Tuesday uh, at Full Sail University. My name is Luis Garcia, and I'm Vice President of Emerging Technologies here at Full Sail University. And today we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Haifa Mahamar, our Education Director of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University. Uh, she's an incredible, uh, accomplished uh, technologist and uh, academic. So let me give you some of her background. Haifa is originally from Tunisia, that's uh, North Africa, and migrated to Ontario, Canada in the early 2000s to pursue her studies at the University of Ottawa. Uh, she earned her PhD in computer and electrical engineering with a focus on mobile networks and mixed reality in 2012. After graduation, Haifa was a research assistant at the Paradise Research Laboratory at the University of Ottawa, participating in, in many research projects spanning from wireless multimedia, collaborative virtual environments, augmented reality, and network security. Uh, she then went to work in the Mont Montreal TMX Stock Exchange as a so software solutions architect, designing software solutions for the training systems of Montreal, Toronto, Boston, Milan, and London. She then joined Full Sail University in 2014 as a course director and in one of our graduate programs. And then she was promoted into several leadership positions in administration, first as a department chair for the gaming development program, and then as a program director for several technology and gaming programs. Finally, uh, in 2019, a couple of years ago, she was promoted for education director of emerging technologies, overseeing all of our technology and gaming programs. So, very special person. Uh, welcome to Tech Tuesday, Haifa. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you for this nice introduction. No, it's just, just talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, uh, Haifa, thank you for joining us. And um, uh, I always just like to start my uh, interviews the same way, I like to ask people, how do you first fall in love with technology and what do you uh, love the most about it? Uh, I think technology and I are a long love story. Um, I would say I started uh, learning about technology and loving technology, technology at a very young age. Um, I, I think I was seven uh, or eight. Um, growing up in Tunisia, um, you know, technology, uh, in the, we're talking in the 80s here, late 80s, 87, um, it was not that um, accessible. But then my dad um, was the CEO of a company, and sometimes he used to go work at night um, at uh, like um, to do some uh, some like finish some tasks, and he would take me with him. So he used to have um, an uh, Apple II, the Macintosh Apple II machine, and uh, I remember the first time I saw the machine, I was so fascinated with the machine, and he actually let me. Uh, play with it. He taught me how to play uh, Pac-Man. So I would spend hours uh, playing uh, Pac-Man. And then, of course, I'm curious. <laughs> and I started trying to know more. What can this machine do? So I saw him use the floppy disk saving machines. And I was like, I want to learn that. How can we save files on floppy disks? I, like they had all these, like back in the 80s, all these colorful uh, floppy disks. And he taught me how to save files on floppy disks and then I was like okay now I want to know more I was wondering learning trying to know more about that um, at the same time during uh, that same time my mom uh, his, she is also a professor and she's in education and she started talking to me about uh, a school that is in Tunisia that is uh, only it's a special school that accepts only the best students uh, of um, of the country. Uh, and these students go and get a special education. Um, it's called the Pioneer School. Uh, at the end of their uh, primary or what we call here elementary school, they have we have a national exam. And only an elite of students and a small percentage of students will go to this special school. And they have a special education that is focused mainly on STEM. So we have advanced mathematics, advanced physics, advanced um, uh, chemistry, but mainly we we learned programming since day one. So 
I studied hard. They helped me, and uh, and I got to join the school. And I started learning programming at the age of eleven. And the first thing I remember uh, was we started learning Pascal. And I know Louise that you learned Pascal as well. And of course, you know, um, we always start with Hello World. So for me, uh, programming Hello World and seeing the machine coming and saying Hello World, I'm like, oh my gosh, the machine is talking to me. And then <laughs> I'm changing it. I'm like, Hello Haifa. And then slowly I started really getting interested in like, I want to know what what can I do more? So I was like trying to add extra things that I can have the machine to stay to me, to stay back. So when I joined uh, that school, I had a dream to become a neurosurgeon that like I was interested in going into the medical school and then uh, really becoming a surgeon. That was a dream. But then as I was going through the middle and high school, I found out that I was really attracted to technology. I was attracted to that problem solving thing. And um, so I, I enjoyed the technology class, the tech class, and I was like always trying to get complex programs, give me more complex programs, let me add extra features to these things. How can I solve this in a different way? So, you know, like in each problem, there's always so many solutions, but like, what's the best solution? You know, like less steps, using functions, add extra stuff, how can we do it? So, um, so yeah, so then by the time I graduated from high school, it was then a choice. Should I go to medical school? Should I join uh, technology? And I, uh, I, I chose to go to the, like to have an engineering uh, career because I love technology. Um, and they had only one, just like one condition. You need to go and get a PhD. You're not going just for a bachelor. You need to go and get a PhD. <laughs> Do whatever you want, but you need to have that graduate degree. Um, so yeah, so they were supportive. Uh, they sent me to Canada. I studied in Canada and I went and did my bachelor's, master's and PhD in computer and electrical engineering. And this is how I kept working in technology, loving technology. And again, like I think what I love about it is how it helps us uh, in our daily life, you know, like uh -huh. we see problems and then how we solve those problems, how we can improve our life, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's that's a fascinating story, and uh, <laughs> uh, I know uh, several people that chose technology over the medical uh, field <laughs> as well, and that's uh, so I can uh, I'm familiar with that story, and I'm so glad that you chose technology. Not that you probably would have been a great doctor too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, but you're a different kind of doctor now. Um, I, so, I Alpha, <laughs> so Alpha, for those that um, you. You hold a very important uh, job here uh, uh, in the administration of the university, and you are the academic leader for our uh, gaming and technology programs and uh, as education director. So uh, for those that may be uh, following us right now and listening, and, um, you know, what is the job of education di uh, director of, of emerging technologies, as you understand it? Uh, I would say... Uh... It depends what what hat I'm wearing for the day, but right. mainly, <laughs> mainly I oversee all the emerging tech programs at uh, Full Sail University. So that uh, includes the gaming program, uh, the game development bachelor, the game design bachelor and masters, uh, the mobile gaming masters, and then the tech programs uh, that includes the computer science bachelor, simulation and visualization bachelor, um, uh, mobile development bachelor, web development bachelor. Uh, information Technology Bachelor and Cybersecurity Bachelor. So I have 10 programs under the Emerging Tech umbrella. Uh, I have uh, four program directors or what we call, uh, they're known as deans in other universities. So I have four deans uh, under uh, the Emerging Tech umbrella and about 250 uh, faculty um, uh, under the Emerging Tech umbrella. And the mission of the Emerging Tech department is to prepare students for innovative design and development careers in dynamic fields like augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, simulation, software, gaming, IT, cybersecurity, mobile development, web development. So we mainly focus on enabling students to adapt to new technologies by allowing them to apply knowledge and practice skills using project-based assessment. So what that means is that I work with an amazing group of educators and we try to make sure that we are giving the students the best uh, education uh, that is out there. 
Also, because we're working in emerging technologies, and we know that technology changes on a daily basis, there are new trends. So we try to be up to date uh, with the trends, and uh, we try to uh, make sure that our programs offer um, offer the skills needed uh, by uh, by the industry. So I work closely with industry leaders, industry experts through our program uh, program advisory committee, and uh, we talk talk on a regular basis to understand what the industry needs, and then we reverse engineer that into skills uh, that are uh, taught within uh, our our programs. Uh, right. Another thing, yeah, another, <laughs> another thing I would say is that uh, also part of my uh, job is to study uh, the industry and understand the kind of where the industry is going uh, and uh, what are the future skills that the industry will need. Uh, and then reverse engineer that into uh, topics thought within the program or courses thought within programs. Sometimes it's entire programs that we need to uh, develop and implement within the emerging tech umbrella. Um, I am a big <laughs> champion, kind of, uh, like I, I, I love my team. Um, uh, my uh, program directors, my deans, my faculty, and I want to make sure that I let the world uh, know uh, what what they're doing and what kind of projects they're working on. Um, so uh, whether they are working on personal projects or sometimes even, even through uh, partnerships with uh, industries. We have lots of partnerships that happen under the emerging tech umbrella with your help, of course, Louise, like you're the one who's like uh, championing all that. And then uh, that actually creates a lot of cool projects for our students. Our students are working on uh, real world projects uh, that they can add to their portfolios. And that actually creates uh, amazing job opportunities for them. So having them, having faculty and students work on these types of projects is uh, also part of uh, the emerging tech umbrella. And then I would say we always work with our uh, outreach team uh, to offer domestic and international experiences in tech. Um, we want to grow in emerging tech at Fulfill. We want the world to know what we do because we do amazing things. So through the outreach team, we offer lots of uh, workshops and experiences, um, whether here in the US or um, outside the international. Oh, well, thank you so much for that uh, for that answer. And uh, so you, I mean, there's a lot that you have to do then. And, and uh, so that's why you say, depending on what hat you're wearing, some days <laughs> I imagine it's more academic, some days it's more partnerships, and some days uh, it's more about the students or the faculty. It's a, it's a very big job. Um, I, I'm always curious uh, with folks that come from uh, traditional education, uh, like you. I mean, you went to a traditional university in Canada. Uh, I took your schooling all the way, you know, from your bachelor's, your master's, all the way to your PhD. And um, in, uh, in a very, well, well, people will say that's a traditional academic environment. Uh, nevertheless, chose to come to full sail uh, to pursue an academic uh, career uh, here in a university that is very, very different. So my curiosity is uh, what is different about full sail that attracted you to this particular institution? You probably could have gone anywhere. <laughs> yes. And I always loved, uh, I wanted to be in academia. I, I love teaching. I used to teach at the University of Ottawa. I taught several courses in electrical and computer engineering uh, departments. I taught several courses in computer science department. I taught programming to business students. Uh, I loved the teaching aspect. I loved interacting with students. So I, I knew in, in my heart that education is what I wanted to to do. I wanted to be part of uh, helping the students get to their dream jobs and uh, getting them, like seeing them successful in their careers. So after I finished my PhD and then uh, I went to work at the stock exchange, um, I mean, granted, I was working on amazing projects. I was the architect uh, building software solutions for several, several trading systems. Um, like the Montreal Stock Exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, Boston, Milan, uh, New York Stock Exchanges. So we, I was working with business analysts to understand the need and then 
taking that, translating that into a software solution, working with programmers, kind of teaching programs what the solution needs to be, how is that going to be impacting the whole trading system, and then working also with QA people, quality assurance people, to so just help them understand the solution. Again, then working with deployment people. So I was kind of like still in that whole, I wouldn't say teaching, but like I'm still working and interacting. But then it was amazing. I, it was like for me, I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm, I'm part of these amazing solutions, amazing products, uh, products that are being implemented. But I always wanted to go back to education. I always wanted to go back to academia. So then I moved to Orlando and I heard about Full Sail. And I think the first thing that intrigued me when I joined Full Sail, or actually before joining Full Sail, is when I was researching Full Sail, I saw the number of gaming programs that are offered at Full Sail. And as you said, I am coming from a traditional university. I want to do a computer engineering bachelor. And again, and I don't remember seeing there was no such a thing as a bachelor in gaming or in game development or game design. Uh, in a traditional university, it's more like in those clear fields of computer science, computer engineering, and so on, but like not something that is gaming related. Um, and then, um, so, and I remember I had, we did learn gaming, but then it will be in an assignment in a programming course. We will do right. a simple game, like a TikTok game, but that's about it. We didn't have a whole program in gaming. And then uh, when I did my PhD, one of the applications of my PhD actually is in MMOs. And I was interested uh, always, uh, you know, like coming from or going to a traditional university, you always think that like, it's gaming. There is no engineering behind it. I don't know what I was thinking until I got to my PhD. And then I noticed like the whole kind of like feel that exists there. And this is why I really wanted to focus on that during my PhD. So um, when I joined Full Sail and I joined as the course director for the Mobile Gaming Masters uh, and I was teaching their final project, I remember I was impressed by the number of hours uh, that the students spent programming. Um, right. Again, working or going through a traditional university, uh, they, we, they, usually at tra traditional university, they focus more on theory and less on hands-on or practice programming, you know? And then when I joined Full Sail, and it's not because I'm working at Full Sail that I'm saying this. I, I am honestly thinking that I'm talking about like my experience, how I was so impressed by the number of hours the students will spend programming. And then when I joined the game development, uh, program and I saw the projects and wow, the quality of projects that the students are working on. I was amazed by these like students and the quality that they're producing. Um, so again, like how here at Wholesale we're focusing on portfolio. I never had such a thing as working on a portfolio to present to employers right. later on. So here at Wholesale, I feel uh, again, we make sure that the student understand what the industry needs since day one. We start talking about this is what the industry needs. These are the skills you need to build or you need to have so to be successful in the industry. So let's work on that. Um, I didn't have that experience and I was really impressed later on that like as a teacher, I'm joining and I'm like, I wish I had that. Uh, so that it's, I mean, yes, I uh, like, thank God, like I'm, I, I ended up <laughs> like I ended up doing well, but also having that kind of background, understanding what the industry needs, understanding what kind of choices I should have made. Maybe I should have made different choices uh, during my right. my bachelor. So that was what the thing really um, helped, like um, kind of interested me and attracted me to fulfill. Thank you. I mean, I, lo I love your answer because. Um, uh, many institutions will will talk about the project based uh, learning, so so they get. They put this through this, their students through projects, and you know there's no other way to learn programming uh, if you're not actually programming. Uh, but we take it a step further, right? You say we say, well, you have to do these projects, but you also have to package them, yeah, as a portfolio, and yeah. um, and, uh, and learn how to pitch it. 
And you know how to to pitch it. Exactly. How how to talk about it, how to go through it. And that's that's a step that, you know, many universities uh, uh, don't take. And then you go to interviews and then you have, you know, all these scattered projects that don't really make sense together. And uh, and we always take it to that portfolio side. So that approach is 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 really different. I'm so glad that you point that out. Um, now, one thing is to live in academia, and we definitely push ourselves a lot in uh, into being at, at the edge of of, of education education and um, and innovating there. But technology, as you mentioned before, also is at the edge <laughs> of innovation constantly. And uh, so being in your job, you have to keep up with both. And uh, so how do you balance this being at the edge of technology and then being at the edge of, of, of education and combining them in our uh, uh, technology programs? Yes, as you said, emerging technologies evolve quickly. And I think uh, one thing here we do well at Fulfill is that because of the pace of our programs, we are able also to evolve uh, quickly and, and, and update our programs based on the technology trends. Uh, so again, I mentioned before that we work a lot with industry experts. This is through our program adv- uh, advisory committee. Uh, we, we work with them, understand what the industry needs, what kind of skills are needed uh, for certain jobs. And then understanding that, then we can reverse engineer that uh, to um, courses or topics or sometimes programs offered uh, uh, within our institution. Um, but also we have our career development uh, uh, department. Also our, our career development department, which is another thing that is amazing, uh, uh, that our students have access to uh, is we they talk to our to the industry leaders um, constantly and then they understand also where the industry is going what kind of technology is needed or skills are needed and then we talk so uh, the education department and the career development department we constantly talk so that we know we are uh, providing and uh, teaching the students the skills that are uh, that will help them uh, and uh, to get the, the like the, their dream jobs. So we try to make sure that we uh, give our students the best and highest chances to get uh, uh, their jobs. Uh, and uh, I mean, again, uh, one thing I want to make sure that I mention is that it's true that technology changes uh, quickly. But um, and it's true that we update our programs, but we don't update our programs uh, just. I mean, like just for the sake of updating, we try to make sure that the technology is solid, that there is a need in the market, in the industry, and then we work hard on making sure that we work quickly to make sure that the students graduate with these skills. Actually, that, that blends very nicely into my next set of questions. And uh, because I know part of your job is to ambition programs for the future and implement mm-hmm. new programs, right? And um, and uh, so we talk a lot about the transformation of education and the role of technology in that. But um, uh, what does education need to focus on to, on to prepare the new generation of technologies? I mean, it's not the same... Uh, to go to a uh, technology school uh, today that it was uh, 30 years ago when I went or, you know. True, uh, or when I went, yeah. A lot sooner than, uh, uh, for you. Uh, but it, even uh, from you, you graduated in 2012, about t- t- 10 years ago uh, from your PhD. Um, so um, also technology have changed quite a bit uh, uh, from there. And uh, the things that we have to prepare uh, the new generation of technologies are different uh, for the next 10 years than it was for the last 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. So what do you think we education needs to focus on uh, to prepare the new generation of technologists? I think we need to go back to the roots, actually. Yes, the technology is changing, but the root is prog- problem solving uh, and critical thinking. Uh, we, when we think about technology, yes, there will be new technologies, there will be emerging technologies, there will be complex problems, but we need to solve that problem and we need to take the best solution to solve that problem. So I would say, make sure to um, 
teach uh, education uh, institutions or the education need to focus mainly on problem solving, making sure that the students understand how to break down a problem into smaller pieces and then target these smaller pieces and then come up with a solution. Again, each problem would have different solutions, but then look at the best solution. From a programming perspective, we're dealing with memory, we're dealing with processors. What is the best solution there? How efficient is your solution? Uh, so I think, again, going back to the roots, going back to the computer science foundation is important. But then when it comes to education as a trend, there is a whole shift in education nowadays is that Students are not, as you said, we, we graduated from the technology pro program like 10, 10 years, 20 years uh, or more, and technology changed. And we went through these long um, programs. And, but I feel that today, nowadays, students are shifting where they don't have the time to go through an entire, like, entire program. They want to focus on their careers. They want an education that is career oriented. So there is a shift about what we call the just-in-time education, which is now dominating education. It teaches the students the skills, knowledge, and technology that the students need today, right now, based on the industry needs, versus the just-in-case education, which is an education that teaches the students the skills and knowledge that the colleges believe they will need in the future. So I feel that students nowadays, um, whether they're traditional or non-traditional, going to traditional universities or non-traditional universities, they're interested in getting a quick degree. They're interested in, which is like then a just-in-time education. They don't have time to go through an entire process. They want to go quickly, get a degree that gives them the skills needed to go get a job right away. Uh, they're not interested in like spending a lifelong learning uh, or like the like long uh, long uh, degrees or long programs. Um, so I feel that um, again, like education institutions or like education need to shift a bit from this is kind of the traditional way of seeing things. We're offering bachelor. I mean, we keep, we need to offer keep offering bachelors and masters and so on. But we I think we have to be open to shorter degrees now, certificates, professional certificates, these kind of degrees or programs that help the students get skills, get career or career skills, jobs right away. I, I love your answer uh, on the part that it says uh, it's about what the industry needs and not what the colleges think that the students are gonna need, right? As said, yes. universities tend yes. to be very monolithic. And so like, this is what we think people are gonna need. And and uh, uh, the other part of your answer about just in, just in time, uh, uh, for some reason, I, I guess the, the world decided that in these four years of your life is when you're gonna learn everything you need to learn about everything. And then and that is gonna end there. And then after yeah. that, you do anything else, you just go on your merry way. But in fact, uh, even more in technology, but almost in every field, that's just the beginning. I mean, it's a lifelong journey of, of constantly learning, right? The things that uh, I learned 30 years ago don't apply today. There are new technologies, new way of uh, looking at things. Uh, but it's critical that, that you understand how to solve problems because the approach okay. of solving problems, that never changes. It's the same. It never changes. It's the same. That's why I said, go back to the roots. Let's focus right. on the core things and then, other things, depending on what the industry is, then go get those skills. But problem solving is important. Foundation is important. So I um, always like to ask about technology itself and the projects you have worked. And uh, as technologists, uh, we have said throughout this conversation, it's about solving problems. And uh, uh, many, many times, uh, we write solutions in, uh, and solve problems that the world does never knows about. And uh, so mm -hmm. every every time I get to interview somebody, I ask him, is there a problem that you solve you feel very proud of that perhaps people don't know about, uh, but you're particularly proud of? Um, I would say, uh, I mean, I don't know if the world does not know about it, but like maybe now it's like the world is gonna know about it. It's, They're gonna uh, know about it now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say uh, during my PhD, actually, my. Uh, uh, 
I, I, during my master's and my PhD, I actually was on a very interesting uh, project. So during my master's, I worked on what uh, telesurgery applications uh, and uh, in collaborative virtual environments. Uh, so I was building a transport protocol that um, I built a tra I built a transport protocol uh, that helped uh, surgeons perform uh, telesurgery on uh, tracheotomy actually surgery on a virtual patient. It was a training system. Uh, so the idea was I, I we used a, a phantom, it's a haptic device that helps uh, surgeons get trained on performing that surgery on a, a virtual patient. And so like making the incision and then moving the skin and then performing the tracheotomy and then uh, closing, uh, closing that, all that using the haptic device. So the haptic device uh, will give that force push back and gives you all the uh, required data to feel as if you're really performing uh, that surgery. Uh, so it was again a training system uh, because um, uh, uh, the hospitals in Canada were trying to make sure that um, uh, if sometimes uh, in Canada is big and sometimes you have surgeons in one city that cannot uh, necessarily travel to a certain to another city to perform that surgery so right. they were talking about making sure that the robot that is in that hospital can perform the surgery but then the surgeon in the in toronto for example can manipulate it with a haptic device or right. so that was the idea for the master's uh, program and then for my phd also i worked on uh, an emergency preparedness class of application. It was with Defense Canada. It was a project with Defense Canada. Was and the idea was that in in case of um, um, let's say um, a, a big fire or like a, a kind of an emergency that happened, how first responders can have an idea of the state of um, the environment there, understand how many uh, casualties there are and then being able to navigate the environment. So the idea was that um, to go ahead and deploy sensors so that the sensors can capture images uh, of the state of the environment. Let's say there was a, a big fire in a building or so whether we're gonna use um, uh, internal sensors or if it was outside, then we can deploy sensors and then they can capture images of, uh, of uh, the state of the environment turn that into a virtual environment so that we can rebuild the virtual environment and stream that to uh, first responders who will be able to navigate through their um, uh, headsets through that virtual environment to understand where the victims are, how bad it is, how, how to prioritize uh, the, the the teams, you know, how where to go first based on the number of casualties. Um, so my contribution there was again making sure I was working on the network uh, layer, building network protocols uh, for all this data that will be created, like the the virtual environment that will be created, and then sending all this data to uh, the head mounted devices, to the um, uh, the headsets, and then making sure that information is um, transmitted uh, reliably and uh, accurately and fast. Again, we're talking like we need to take decisions quickly. So all this information needs to happen quickly and sent quickly uh, to the first responders. Um, so is yeah, would that so is that, did that include also transport protocol and uh, oh, yeah, that yeah, second? Yes, yes, yes. Let, 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 let me just stop protocol. because. Uh, uh, for those that are listening to us, what a transfer pro uh, transfer protocol is, and um, uh, so is 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 a part of the transmission that that uh, is a protocol in which you send data through a transmission. So the the protocol that most people are familiar with because they type it every day in the browser is HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So when you do that, then the internet knows what, what you do, and um, and uh, some very smart guys wrote that transfer protocol. There's another one called FTP, which is file transfer protocol, and that's how we exchange files. And um, so you're telling me that you're one of the person that wrote a transfer protocol and uh, so, for surgeons. So yeah, and for well, we're talking about, 
Yes. So there is what we're talking about, the layers and the network layer, as you like, there is uh, two main uh, things are the TCP and the UDP. And those are, again, so it's a combination, uh, again, like you decide depending on what kind of network you're dealing with. And here in this case, we're dealing with mobile networks because we have head mounted devices, we have virtual environments, we have all, all this data that is transmitted and people are moving. So we're wireless networks here. Right. So, yes, so we're transmitting all this data through the, like the transport protocols that I created, yes. <laughs> oh, that's pretty amazing. Never met a person that made a transfer protocol. I remember studying HTTP and said, well, people are pretty smart. They create this transfer protocol. Uh, before that, I actually, I studied a lot of MIDI, which is a transfer protocol for, for music. It's a musical interface. And mm -hmm. uh, MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And, uh, and it also has its own transfer protocol as well. And um, that, that, that's pretty cool. So. I can imagine you've probably solved a million problems in those two projects. And <laughs> what about problems that you could not solve? And, uh, which I'm pretty sure those two projects had a lot of problems that you could not solve as well. Yeah, actually, yes and no. But you know how I said before that I I wanted uh, to uh, become a neurosurgeon. So I was right. always trying to um kind of mix those two fields or like make sure that these two fields are uh, I work on these two fields together so I was interested in in um in joining technology to healthcare uh and again during my PhD as I was working on that project again you're talking about transport protocols and then it depends what kind of application like here I'm talking like for my PhD I worked on uh, the peer to peer um, um, like supplying partner protocols, but one of the applications that I was really interested in was in healthcare, and I was interested in childhood obesity. Uh, and you know how childhood obesity it, it leads to several life threatening conditions such as diabetes, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, mental health problems like depression, anxiety, loneliness. I mean, there are so many different uh, issues. And one of the innovative approaches back then that started to emerge was what we call um, exergaming. And exergaming is the combination of exercising and 3D gaming uh, to incite kids to exercise. And during my PhD, again, remember I said like, we're, like people are collaborating together, transferring data to each other. So there was this new trend and I was interested in collaborative exergaming. And collaborative exergaming was very important, especially in this, um, in, in, in obesity and in exergaming because it addresses the social side of the obesity problem. And it motivates kids to socialize with others or with other kids. So as they're exercising and playing games, they're also socializing. They're not dealing with loneliness. They have that, aspect to talk to others, to interact with others. And I was really passionate about that because I, yeah. for me, I'm finally combining two words, combining healthcare and medical to technology. And I wanted to do, like, I saw a lot of potential there. Um, I was passionate, but the problem is I was towards the end of my PhD back then. And if I go down that route, it means that I'm adding an e easily two to three years to my PhD. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I had one publication about exergaming. And then after talking to my advisor back then, we decided to let that go. And it always stayed with me because um, it, you know, it, it was a passion for me. Uh, as a researcher, we, all, we try to solve a lot. Like there are so many problems <laughs> and we want to solve all the problems. And, uh, and, and, but also we need to learn when to stop. Uh, and uh, I had to take that decision then to stop at that point and not go further uh, because uh, it, me it meant that I'm just adding more years when I was ready to graduate. So yeah, I take that as kind of like a, a failure because it was really dear to my heart and I couldn't <laughs> get there. <laughs> when I ask that question, I usually talk uh, 
I call it the one that got away. And uh, and this case, I think, is pretty real, actually, for you. I mean, that's the problem that you didn't get to solve. But, you know, life is long. and um, I know, and, right? Uh, I can have students here and then start working again. Exactly. <laughs> so on, on some of the applications that we have been studying here are actually uh, very similar to, to healthcare. And, obviously, we they do are. so much gaming. And, yeah. and uh, our students are doing amazing thing. I have the pleasure to travel and go and visit, you know, companies and studios. And, you know, we are, our graduates are behind some of the, you know, most played uh, games, uh, titles out there. And also creating pretty, pretty amazing technologies and solving a pretty uh, amazing uh, uh, problems. And, and you're here kind of um, uh, influencing all of it uh, through, through the work that you do with your with your heads of school and the, and the faculty, and uh, but ends up in 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 the brain of that one student that goes and graduate and do amazing things with the knowledge. So do you do you stop to think about what that means? I actually never stop. It's an honor for me to be part of that movement, but also I I, I keep this in my forefront. Uh, at the forefront of my thoughts uh, when I think about uh, future offering of curriculum or when I think about the students or when I think about the staff. Um, I, I feel that my job as an education director of emerging technologies is to pave the way for future technologies, to pave the way uh, for future trends. And um, I'm honored to be part of it. So, uh so let, let, let me ask you this then, and it's probably uh, uh, along the same lines, but uh, every person that I interview has been quite successful. And, and uh, I think that part of that success is being uh, self-aware and understanding your strengths and how do you apply them. And uh, how, those turn into your superpower. How do you, how, how do you apply what you're very good at in, uh, into your work? And uh, what do you think is your superpower? <laughs> um... Uh, I don't know. I think, I guess, I, I look at everything. Uh, um, I think my tenacity, I would say. I'm very tenacious. And uh, if, if you give me a challenge, I love, to, I love challenges. And, and again, I look at the challenge as a problem. I go back. A and problem like, to solve, this, yeah. is a pro this is a problem to solve. Let me break it down. What kind of solution? Which one is the efficient solution? And then right. go to that. <laughs> So I think uh, I think that uh, I would say my my superpower. What what um, the, that tenacity and the curiosity is another thing that you say that you have very early. So it's kind of like two things, two ingredients that I think every technologist has to have. Uh, you know, curiosity and tenacity. Um, what would you tell someone interested in pursuing a career in technology? Please do it. Please do it. <laughs> Go. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is projecting growth of 22% in software developers and IT jobs between 2019 and 2029. So this is way faster than the average. And it means that there is so much demand for tech people and tech jobs than the number of developers we currently have working or we're currently graduating. So there is always a need. It's a, a field that's growing, that's booming, and it, it, it pays a lot to be in technology, it, like not only from financial perspective, but like even from an, like a personal, like achievement, like you feel achieve, like you feel a sense of like, um, how to say it, like, um, uh, um, like, yeah, you're like you're achieving something when you're part of, uh, of technology. So I would say, Please go. And I am known for like trying like to um, empower women to join computer science and the tech field. So female, this is not a field for men only. This is a field where female can succeed, can be very successful. Uh, uh, yes, now the trend is that it's male dominated, but trust me, you can be very successful in technology. So please go in anything that is computer science and IT and cyber, you would be very successful uh, in that field. So don't think about it, just go. All right, thank you so much. And uh, our last question, and it's been incredible to, to have this conversation with you, but 
um, you know, you get to see what's going on out in the world. You said you have to look at trends and see how they apply to to what we do here and how in the um, um, so what do you see in technology today that gets you really excited about the future? I think um, the amazing or the unlimited number of opportunities that uh, that exist. You know, there is no limit to technology. Again, if we make sure that we're using technology safely, uh, we're using technology ethically and like for ethical, like to to help improve our life to help improve our daily life, uh, to use it in education, in healthcare, in entertainment, to make it better. Um, there is no limit. So that's what makes me very um, like um, ambitious about the future. And I want to be part of that future. I want to see uh, the kind of new emerging technology that will be coming up uh, in the future. Well, thank you so much, Haifa. This was uh, a pleasure to have this conversation about thank you. Thank you. And, you know, even though we we, we, we speak and uh, we work together every day, I learn a lot, so much more today. And uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. Uh, I believe the gift of time is the biggest gift you, give, you can give someone. So I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and for so those much. that are uh, hearing us today and, and looking at this, uh, thank you so much for joining us as well. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another uh, leader in technology here in Tech Tuesday. Uh, have a great day and goodbye.